In this interview, I'm going to be talking to energy economist Ed Hurst of the University of Houston, and we're going to be discussing the role of gas uh, turbines, gas combined cycle turbines in uh, North American power grids, and why it isn't the cheap fallback that many people are assuming it is. Welcome to the interview, Ed. Thank you. Good to see you. Well, likewise, uh, this is a real uh, interesting story because there are jurisdictions and Alberta next door to where I live is the big one uh, where they've said the premier, Danielle Smith, has said very clearly, we are a gas producing province. We will produce, use our gas to produce our electricity. And as demand ramps up, because we're talking three to four percent a year now, uh, load growth, as demand ramps up, uh, there's a, a, an equipment shortage, isn't there? And that equipment shortage is not just not just in Canada. It's it's a shortage across the U.S. It's a shortage across Europe, across Africa, um, uh, especially in areas where oil and gas development have been been underway. Um, uh, the Mediterranean area has got some massive gas plays and and pipes being constructed to to replace the the gas that was coming from Russia. Um, you know, industrialization requires electricity and, uh, you know, gas fired turbines are really pretty easy to do. Uh, essentially, they're jet engines. But the cost, uh, at least in the U.S., for these has, has almost doubled. So a combined cycle gas turbine unit that might have cost a um, billion dollars for a one gigawatt facility is now uh, priced out at about two to two point five billion dollars. So what does that do in terms of the, uh, first of all, uh, the, the cost of power to consumers, because those capital costs have to be passed along uh, to the customers at some point, uh, but also the availability of gas. Uh, if you build out more domestic power plants, presumably that puts more, uh, more demand on your gas supply. Uh, will we see gas prices rising uh, for North American consumers? Well, eventually we we probably will. But right now, the U.S. has much more stranded gas than it has outlets for it. Uh, keep in mind that during during Trump 1.0, the Constitution and Atlantic pipelines that were to bring natural gas to the Atlantic seaboard and, and to the New England states, those were canceled under Trump. Um, and that would have brought gas from the Marcellus and Utica formations. And, and what we've seen with the announcement of the Pennsylvania Energy Summit a few weeks ago is, um, well, now they can build a lot of pipes in states. So Pennsylvania is on top of this and, and they'll feed their own power plants. Uh, but getting the gas to, to market into New England uh, is, is a challenge. Uh, the Constitution pipeline has uh, uh, been restarted by its developer. It's likely to go through this time. But I started writing about this in uh, 2008. You know, the challenge we've had in the United States with gas pipelines is that they're so tightly regulated in terms of, of the economics that it doesn't pay Wall Street to invest in new pipes and it doesn't pay developers to go propose them. And so as a result, we wind up with these, these strange looking dislocations. For example, in 2000, 2001, um, gas went in at Waha in the Permian Basin at $2.50 an MCF, and it came out at the Southern California City Gate at $12.50. Now, that was, that was one of Enron's big wins. Uh, and, you know, that amount of money, that huge displacement, you know, could have could have built two pipelines for them. Um, you know, right now the uh, Texas economy is booming because the state is building a lot of intrastate pipes to take the gas to the ports on the Gulf Coast to export the the LNG. Yeah, we should point out that in the United States is very similar to to Canada in that uh, inside a state's borders. In, in, in Texas, for example, the Railroad Commission uh, is the regulator for pipelines. It was yes. As long as it doesn't cross a state border, uh, it's the state regulator. But as soon as you cross a border, then you're getting into FERC territory or, and other federal uh, regulations. Now, one of the thing, reasons I'm interested in this story is because last week we had news stories coming out of Canada that the two big Canadian uh, pipeline companies, TC Energy and Enbridge, uh, don't want to build in Canada anymore. They, they, they're not interested. They think the opportunities are uh, much better down in the U.S. Uh, to deploy their capital, as they say. Uh, but what you're saying is, 
it sounds like that actually is still a, the U.S. is a difficult market to get pipes built and also to have the uh, the power plants, for example, built to consume that gas. Yes, and so for for many of the gas power plants that that were built in the uh, uh, late '60s, early '70s, and then then again in that brief spate during the late '80s and early '90s, uh, it's because they had direct connections to the interstate interstate lines, um, and and that way they could rely upon a, a reliable supply. One of the challenges of building power plants in, in the New England states right now is the pipes don't have enough capacity to meet demand during winter time. Uh, there's not enough storage available. And, you know, ideally there should have been three or four pipes built. Instead, we're relying upon the big inch and little inch, which were built during World War II, uh, converted uh, ones, a converted oil line. Um, this is a challenge for, for U.S. policymakers. FERC, uh, still uh, rides herd on interstate pipelines, and, and that re removes the investment incentive. Um, now, both the Biden administration and the Trump administration have talked about uh, pursuing long-distance transmission lines, but, but a large one was just canceled. Um, you know, there, it's either got to be a molecule or an electron that gets to the end user. And... Um, uh, the, the Trump administration has yet to really develop a, a, a usable game plan for that. So in, if I understand this correctly, and this will be the, my last question for you, but if I understand this correctly, we've got a problem on the demand side with uh, getting pipes, getting gas to cons residential consumers, industrial consumers, also to uh, power plants, which can't uh, be built quickly enough because there's a shortage of five to eight year backlog of equipment. And then on the supply side, we've got the U.S. has got all of this gas that's stranded uh, because it can't build pipes. Uh, it just seems like a, a mess for during a time which demand is is projected to grow at very rapid rates. Exactly, and so uh, you know some of the the power companies are looking at building building gas units, but you know what's going to be the expected lifetime for that? Now in Texas. Um, uh, the city of San Antonio bought two fairly recently built natural gas combined cycle power plants for less than 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, NRG, uh, the big power plant owner uh, based in Houston, uh, bought, I, I think, up to 12 gigawatts of power plants from uh, a hedge fund and paid essentially 50 cents on the dollar for what it would cost to build them new. And, and you know, they're looking ahead at the, the end user market, if you will, that, that's going to be dominated by renewable, which has zero fuel cost. And in the case of uh, solar, uh, very, very modest labor, uh, you know, easily 10% of what a, a natural gas power plant would hire, maybe, maybe even just 1%. And so the operating costs are key and uh, uh, the gas plants aren't going to be built unless they can be assured of making a return on capital. Well, Ed, thank you very much for this. Um, it looks like things are going to be chaotic for a while. We'll be checking in with you on a regular basis to find out what progress the, uh, the American states are making. Thank you very much. My pleasure.